Thank you. So you can't open a newspaper without reading about the economy. And some may think that this is a brand new problem, that it dates perhaps to the Wall Street collapse in 2008 or a few years before that. It didn't start in 2008. It didn't start in 2000. It didn't even start in the 1990s. The seeds of our difficulty were very well recognized by our major industrial and governmental leaders even back in the late 1970s. When young Tom Kane was a freshman governor, in 1982 he created the Governor's Commission on Science and Technology. It's a must read, not just for the people in New Jersey, for this country, because the leaders of New Jersey industry, which were in fact the leaders of American industry, clearly recognized all of the danger signs which history has proven <laughs> we fell into every single trap along the way. More about them later. In the middle uh, 1980s, President Reagan had an industrial competitiveness task force or commission. The leader, John Young, ex-CEO uh, of Hewlett Packard, then went on to form the Council on Competitiveness, which exists today. One of their early work, work products was a report by Professor Michael Porter at Harvard which brought into a popular lexicon the concept of clusters of innovation. The idea that regions could take on a specialty and in a sense become, without being one company, a combine of companies which at every level of supply chain competed with each other to get better and better and yet work collaboratively up and down that supply chain to bring new products to market. A very important concept and today increasingly when we talk about solving the ills of not only New Jersey's economy, but the US economy, we're seeing that such clusters are pervasive around the world, and we need to figure out how to do that here in the United States and in the state of New Jersey. Well, guess what? When we talk about clusters, at one time, New Jersey was the mother of all clusters. I would argue that virtually every single major industrial function in the United States has a very strong footprint right here in New Jersey, most here in northern New Jersey, in the period in the late 1880s to the early 1920s. I could spend an hour on this slide talking about the history of each one of these companies, but just imagine a cluster that begins with Thomas Edison, not only with electric power generation, electric lighting, and the inventiveness in what we might say is personal entertainment space and movies, but that infrastructure for creating electronics then served to draw in AT&T and, and Bell and, and, and all that great too in, in terms of Ma Bell and the anchor that was in our economy. And if that were not enough, that competency in building vacuum glass led to the creation of a competency to build vacuum tubes, which then became the mainstay of radio and ultimately television technology. So we have a whole uh, electronics, telecommunication, broadcast industry cluster right here in New Jersey. Any one of those would be the envy of most countries, if not most states. But if that were not enough, take the bottom thread, the process industry thread. Standard Oil moved here out of Ohio because of favorable tax conditions in the 1880s and set up a refinery right here in Linden. It still operates under a different name, but up until uh, very recently was in fact the Esso and then Exxon refinery. It's no mistake that immediately next door, when George Merck was looking for a place to move his pharmaceutical production uh, from its home in Germany to the United States, he bought 150 acres immediately adjacent to the Exxon refinery, then S Standard Oil refinery, because that's his source of raw materials. And that clustering then also encouraged the birth of the modern plastics industry. When Leo Bakelin brought his, his invention of the world's first commercial plastic, Bakelite, product produced here in Perth Amboy, New Jersey, and ultimately uh, uh, his Bakelite company became the basis of Union Carbide, which then ultimately was bought by Dow. The modern plastics industry, which not only had many end products of use into itself, but guess what? It was the important enabler for the electronics industry because they were making the plugs and the sockets and the enclosures for lighting, for radios. Much of this was done with his phenolic resin. And that basic competency also then gave rise to our ability to do commercialized food processing. And so it's not a mistake that Campbell's Soup developed here in New Jersey, not only because we have great Jersey tomatoes for that tomato rice soup, but because we had the core competency in equipment and in personnel to drive it. And if you tie all those pieces together, we have the medical device industry where the Johnson brothers began marketing first aid kits and sterile gauze post-Civil War, but that really launched the, com com the company was the ability to take that sterile gauze and, and put it on a sticky tape, which became the Band-Aid, and the rest is history. So what happened? We had it all. How did we lose it all? 
there is a very important piece of work that gets very little attention by a gentleman named Richard Lester, a professor at MIT, who did a worldwide study of regional economies globe and across the country to better understand how and why they form, why are they successful, and as we'll see subsequently, what's the proper role for a university in advancing those cultures. And one of his important early conclusions is that clusters, while they are always good when they start, can go down very different and divergent paths. And the bad path, for the sake of the local economy, is called hollowing out. The companies become larger, more important, more dependent on their own resources, and in fact, stretch to reach their national and then global markets. And you can see the pattern in each one of those companies. As they grew, they became less and less dependent on the culture and the environment of an industrialized New Jersey and began producing oil across the country and across the world, pharmaceuticals globally, to the point where all you needed to have locally were your executive offices. And that's a very easy commodity to move. Once you find better golf courses, it's very easy to convince people that life is much better in Virginia, in Texas, in California, much more difficult when you have to move an entire supply chain. And so hollowing out is not a good thing, but sustained growth comes when, in fact, you can begin to orchestrate this concept that Porter also described, in which instead of large-scale, vertically integrated companies that do everything, the old AT&T used to mine copper. Why? Because they would coat it with plastic and wrap it into bundles and use that to connect to modular plugs, to connect to the phone that had a plastic they invented that won't break when you drop it. Why? Because they wanted to sell you long-distance service. So they did everything. That's the model that has disappeared out of the uh, basic approach to business structure here in the United States is the large-scale vertical integration. So the question is, how do you sustain that now so that you have a regional culture that creates that capacity and can innovate across the supply chain? I'm going to use a device in the next several slides <coughs> that show a push and pull, if you will, or a tug between two different forces that help shape and define and organize uh, the different things that we'll be talking about in each slide. In this case, one of the very powerful outcomes of Lester's work was to talk about different types of regional clusters because we need some myth busting here, right? We have some ideas that we cling to, some visions about how things get done that can enslave us because they limit our thinking. And one of those is that a cluster is what I would call the Silicon Valley model. He calls it creating a new industry. The only way you get a cluster is to have someone smart in a university invent a disruptive technology, you push it out the door and you commercialize it. And we've seen even for, for more than the last decade, probably for the last 25 years, region after region lining up to be the next valley, fill in the blank. We're Rubber Valley, we're Bio Valley, we're Pharma Valley, we're IT Valley, we're Google Valley, we're App Valley, and they never really get off the ground. It's a very, very rare subset of the many regional economies that have been successful. And so the enlightening part that comes from Richard's work is that there are other ways and there are examples in each one of these that are from the 20 or so different places that he sent study teams. We had a faculty member, uh, our professor emeritus in management, Alec Chakrabarty, who spent time in, in Tampere, Finland. But in order to keep this compact, let me talk about New Jersey instances that can give light to how we might accomplish these same divisions. And so, yes, we can, in fact, engage in the creation of new industry. You all know that New Jersey was, was in the business of trying to figure out what to do with stem cell technology. We spent the better part of five or six years. And unfortunately, we got wrapped around the axle of human embryonic stem cell research instead of looking at the bigger picture of regenerative medicine, of the future which is going to happen and it's happening around us, of being able to take our own cells, wind them backwards and forwards, and have them become, in a sense, a way of creating our own spare parts from, from our own biology. And, and, and figuring out how to turn that from something you do with a Petri dish to something you can do on a regularized, industrialized basis, whatever that means, that would allow you to define a disruptive technology with, with revolutionary proportions. We can still do that. The second part, some might say, is also could happen very easily in New Jersey. You just grab somebody else's industrial base and you make it a fertile home for them. Uh, one of our speakers this morning said, steal good ideas. Or if you want to do it soprano style, you make them an offer they can't refuse. Eh? What does it mean? You create through policy, through workforce training, through improvements to infrastructure, you make yourself a desirable place to be that particularly appeals to an existing or emerging industrial base. Well, we could do that in almost anything because we have that rich heritage, but we could talk, for example, that solar energy, 
and its future evolution in terms of building integrated photovoltaics, distributed energy generation, is a kind of industry that we could wrap our arms around and become a very, very attractive place that would evolve out of our heritage in electronics as well as, as, as in uh, uh, other elements of advanced information systems. Not every industry that's struggling needs to die. And in some cases, you just need to rethink what is your core competency. He has examples, uh, 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 for example, the rubber industry in Akron that moved from tire manufacturing to advanced elastomers. Well, perhaps our pharmaceutical industry will have to redefine itself because the orchard of blockbuster drugs available to us through the traditional organic chemistry routes is becoming more and more difficult to harvest. And yet we're seeing increasingly biotechnology, biosynthetic routes, biomimetic routes, all of these become things which are not part of the core competency of traditional pharma, and yet who is going to bring those to market? Who better uh, to mine the ability to organize and bring all that stuff together and ultimately get it into clinical practice. And so it may be a mashup between our emerging small biotechs and our large pharmas, not necessarily buying them out, but organizing them in a supply chain to replace the vertical integration that dominates pharma today, may in fact be a route available for New Jersey to expand. And lastly, you can just get smart about what you do and infuse new technology into it. There's so many examples where you can take information technology and plow it into a good, solid core business and do it smarter and faster. But even the business of information technology can be an example. Cell phone companies used to do what? They shuttle calls back and forth, right? But now your cell phone is not just a phone. Your cell phone's a computer. And so now our cellular carriers are perhaps going to be the equivalent to the broadcast industry, to the entertainment industry, to the communications industry, the data exchange industry, the so-called digital convergence that we've waited 25 years to happen is now technologically available to us, and those are companies that may in fact profit from that. So the myth that we've busted is that the only way to form an economy is for universities to get smarter and more applied and push their work out the door into commercialization. There are other ways to do it. The second finding that he had is that in fact there is a positive role for universities in all of these. And ultimately the most important thing that he found regardless of the core activity is that universities create what he called public space, a place in which companies can come together, academics can come together, exchange ideas. Where have we heard that idea? You heard the lecture from Stephen Johnson, right? right? Well, guess what? Next slide, Stephen Johnson. And the same thing. This chart is, uh, is a uh, iconified version of a chart from his book in which, again, the push-pull. He said we have to look at different ways in which ideas emerge. And in one dimension, there's the drive for commercialization. In the other dimension, what I call network diversity, where one extreme is the solitary scientific entrepreneur, and the other extreme is uh, open innovation uh, of the entire global community. And one of his important points is that the myth of the solitary entrepreneurial inventor is in fact just that, a myth. That if you do head counts of some uh, 150, 200 examples of innovation that he documented, there are only a very, very small number that fit that model uh, that we have, in fact, lionized. And if that's true going back to 1800, imagine how difficult it's going to be in the future to really be a garage inventor. When we're talking about working with nanotechnologies, we're talking about cellular, molecular biology, all these things require not only a broad range of competencies, but an arsenal of tools and technology that you're not going to find in the average basement. So premise number one is that it takes a village to raise an idea, and we certainly agree with that. The other thing that perhaps he didn't say as strongly as, as I think needs to be said is that when you look at the equator in that chart, the difference between the innovations that are in the top and the innovations that are in the bottom, you'll see a very interesting demarcation. You can't because those icons may not tell the story the way his word chart does. But the innovations on the top are products and services. They're things that you can touch and feel and identify as having commercial impact, and that's why there's a market driver. The ones on the bottom tend to be ideas. They are discoveries. They are scientific discoveries. And so now we have a very clear demarcation between the world of scientific discovery and the world of invention. And very often people confuse those things and think that research is all about discovery that automatically leads to commercial products and services, but that's not the case. And so, number one, we've, I hope, lanced the myth that all inventiveness has to come from the solitary performance, the sole performer. But number two, we segue to our next chart, which talks about why people do research and hopefully breaks again the third myth 
which is that big science always begets commercial products. And there's a linear flow down the hill from discovering the big ideas to then the lesser people who apply it to then the Neanderthals who actually commercialize it, bring it to market, and manufacture it. What Donald Stokes did in his book called The Pasteur Quadrant is show there are very different drivers as to why people do research. And in particular, he identifies two axes. Are we driven by practicality? Are we trying to make a product or a service? Are we just trying to make a fundamental contribution to mankind, to improve the, the state of knowledge? And in identifying those important categories, there's a patron saint for each of the three. The uh, what we worry quadrant is my own contribution. Nobody wants to be both uh, non-fundamental and not practical. So we'll not talk about the quadrant of self-indulgence, but talk about the quadrant of pure basic research. Well, every academic understands that. That's what we have been configured, in fact, by national policy, to focus on the development of fundamental science. That's been our role, and to train students to be the next generation of workers. Very clear articulation uh, that dates back to Vannevar Bush, Science the Endless Frontier, uh, who, uh, who did that work while Roosevelt was still alive and it was ultimately executed uh, under Truman and Eisenhower. And it's created the whole basis of funding for uh, uh, public and even private sector universities to grow their research and development enterprises. And based on a very clear notion of roles and responsibilities divided between industry and university. The other extreme, which is also easy to get your arms around, is Edisonian research. Right? I'm there to, to make a product. No one ever accused Edison of creating a new theory but that's not a slap at him. He's actually, that's a wonderful thing what he's done. And, and we live, even with us t around us today, all the evidence of his powerful contributions. No less intellectual and no less important that was done by those who discovered the basic structure of the atom. But what makes Stokes' work so important in my mind is the identification of this hybrid quadrant that he calls the Pasteur Quadrant or use-inspired research. Because it's here that he says, you know, really resides a very important place where you work on not firefighting or incremental improvement or the products of your company now, but you work on reinventing the future. The disruptive technologies come out of here. Not only is it an important function, but then we have to put that in the framework of the American economy post-World War II. Where did Pastorian research take place? It took place in the large-scale industrial research and development labs. Bell Labs is iconic from that period. Why did they invent the transistor? Not because they were interested in dabbling in surface physics, because they knew that the vacuum tube generated too much heat to possibly scale to the communications enterprise of the, of the, of the country, much less the world. And there are many, many other examples. And you can go through every industry, Western Electric Research, GEC R&D, Shell Development Corporation, the entire inventiveness that we have benefited from from the last 50 years has come from people whose feet were on the ground or whose heads were in the clouds. So not only was this an important element in, 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 a motiv in terms of motivation of doing research, where you had access to the problems and issues of a sector, but also the intellect and the ability to, to pull back and harvest out of the academic environment, but the people, again, you go back to Stephen's premise, there was a human network here. These were the people who went to the technical professional societies. They mingled with the professors. They brought the professors in as consultants. This was the human pipeline that brought information out of the dirty marketplace, the needs and problems that still had the time to step back, not be consumed by the fire around them, but actually be able to think beyond the short term and look at dynamic ways of taking the theoretical knowledge base that was being created and make that connection. And so if I, if, if I can be passionate about anything, it's the fundamental need for us to find a new way to be Pastorian. It's not to take all our professors and say, stop doing basic work and start doing applied work. And it's not to tell our companies to stop solving the problems and get products out the door tomorrow. We need to find a way, in fact, if we honor all of the speakers and, and, and the books that I've just acknowledged, to innovate across supply chains, across corporate boundary lines, and be able to still preserve the commercial value that comes out of that work while pulling in all the resources that are necessary to do it. And that really is then the core of what we mean when we talk about the new model for a regional economy. If I were a web page now, there would be a link, and I'd press it, and I would jump back. Why? Because at the very beginning of the talk, I spoke about the Governor's Commission of Science and Technology then beget the New Jersey Commission of Science and Technology. And one of their important recommendations was, guess what? In 1982, 
15 years before this book was issued, the creation of Pasteurian centers. The idea of the advanced technology centers that they described was to create on university campuses sector-focused advanced development centers that would tap into the knowledge base of the university but not behave like universities. And so, as Edison said, right, genius is 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. We didn't do the other 99%. We allowed those centers to become academic research centers so they were all Borean and no Pastorian. And in many cases, the industries they were supposed to build, grow, and sustain have disappeared. It's not that the idea was wrong, it's the execution was bad. Again, Edison said, so much of failure is simply people who stopped one step short of accomplishing the goal. They were that close. I think we have a chance here in New Jersey to learn from our successes in our past and our failures in our past and chart a new course that pulls together in a very meaningful way the resources of university, the still rich resources we have in our industries and in our workforce. And if we can, perhaps that will allow us to go back to a future in which New Jersey is a leader in a producer nation as a producer state. And I think we'll all enjoy then another 100 years of prosperity here in New Jersey. Thank you all.